Good evening, everyone, and thank you for taking the time out of your Thursday evening to come join us in this webinar. So for today, we're all here to discuss taking the stress out of buying New York residential properties. My name is Rachel Ho. I'm the Senior Manager of Seville's and uh, from the International Residential Services Team of Singap Seville, Singapore. So if you don't already know, Seville's is a uh, global company. We do have 600 offices worldwide employing over 39,000 people in 60 countries. So today we will invite uh, Mr. Robert Chadwick and we are very proud to have him here with us today. Uh, he's the CEO of American Mortgages and he's uh, going to talk about the topic of knowing your mortgages. And with that, I'd like to pass on to Robert to come and speak with us on this topic. And following which, we will have Miss Lydia, who will be talking on Texas, as well as a New York property update by Mr. Julian Sedwick. Robert, may I hand it over to yeah, you now? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending. And thanks to Seville's for allowing us to attend the event. Well, my name is Robert Chadwick. I am one of the co-founders of Global Mortgage Group and America Mortgages. Let me start up. So we'll be covering U.S. mortgages for foreign nationals and U.S. expats. Uh, Global uh, America Mortgages is a member of Global Mortgage Group. We're a high net worth based mortgage originator uh, based in Singapore. Um, our American Mortgages sole focus is foreign national mortgages. Uh, for U.S. expats and foreign nationals. So 100% of our clients are living somewhere abroad. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so 100% of our clients are living somewhere abroad, um, earning their income abroad, and uh, most of the time they don't have any U.S. exposure. So no U.S. credit, um, no U.S. Uh, uh, exposure at all. So we work exclusively on behalf of our clients. We have over 150 onshore and international uh, mortgage lenders that we deal with. Um, if it's a very specific uh, loan program, we can actually be very bespoke on how we design it. So uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of data, globally, approximately 93% of all real estate is purchased with a mortgage whether it's investment or uh, owner-occupied property, if someone has the opportunity to use leverage, they normally will. Last year, this is about, this is the US alone, uh, more than $50 billion was purchased of US real estate by foreigners. So it's a significant number, but it only makes up about 5% of the entire US real estate market, which means a lot of uh, mortgage lenders, a lot of uh, finance institutions actually kind of overlook this because it's a very small uh, client base that they're dealing with. So if you look at nine out of 10 people are gonna use a mortgage for foreign national mortgages because of the excess of uh, availability, actually only about three out of 10 people will actually use a mortgage in the US. And this is why we created American Mortgages. So uh, why, why American Mortgages? Well, as I just discussed, 100% of our clients are living and working overseas. All of our loan programs are very specific for this. We only focus on foreign nationals and expats. Uh, we have representation in 12 different countries. Uh, we speak seven different languages and then understand the cultural nuances that would be, you know, just as an example, Hong Kong has no zip code, that kind of thing. Uh, all loan programs do not require US credit. So as long as you have credit in Singapore, uh, you're, we can use that credit report in lieu of U.S. credit. Uh, closing documents can be signed without going to the U.S. So you can open an application, you can close an application all within Singapore. Uh, there are various ways to close it, and I'll actually go into that in a little more detail. Um, the most important thing is we have common sense underwriting. So all of our underwriting, as you'll see with our loan programs, are they make sense. It's not... Uh, it's not regulated by all sorts of uh, red tape. It's a very smooth, easy process. Um, loan programs that are simple and easy to understand. What makes the US quite unique, and oh, I don't know if, if everybody is aware of this, but there's no age restrictions. So whether you're 19 or 99, you can still get a 30-year amortization 
Um, we even have loan programs that uh, are as high as 40 years, uh, which we offer also loan programs that have interest servicing only, which um, if you're looking at where interest rates are now, as obviously they've increased over the last few months, um, if you can do an interest servicing only loan, it allows you to get better yields if you're looking for an investment property and you can fix these for uh, up to 10 years. 40-year um, mortgages are available and that's part of the uh, interest only. So how it works is the first 10 years, interest servicing fixed. After the 10-year period, it converts into a 30-year fixed without any adjustment in rate. So if you look at kind of how rental yields will go, it should actually work with it. Uh, and we do loans in all 50 states. Uh, we're very transparent on fees and process. The day that you or three days after you apply for the loan, you'll actually get loan disclosures. Those loan disclosures will say all of the costs in breaking down the loan. Those loan disclosures have to be at or at less than what your final closing costs will be. So they won't be a surprise when you actually get to the uh, closing desk. And we have 24 access, 24 seven access with loan officers and processors all around the world. Um, the general mortgage overview, uh, no US credit is required. Uh, it's great if you have uh, credit from some country because then you know we can put you into a better program. Um, no AUM is required. So if you look at some of the banks that are offering uh, US mortgages, they require you to have a, a, you know, a, a private banking account that you actually have to fund. These are all dry lending. Foreign income is allowed and accepted. Loan programs in all 50 states. We can get actually very high leverage for foreign nationals, 75%. In some cases, uh, we can actually get up to 80%. Um, if you're a U.S. passport holder, you can qualify just as you were to walk into a bank and you get up to 80% financing. Normally, our loan approval, once we have all the documents, is within 72 hours. But we can normally issue an approval, a pre-approval letter that when you, uh, you know, put your offer in with Seville's, you, you normally have some sort of financing offer. We can issue you that letter within 24 hours. Uh, closing time is 30 to 45 days. Again, you can sign the closing documents in most major countries, uh, whether it is uh, over a video um, at the US Embassy or Singapore is part of The Hague, so you can actually get it signed at a local notary and then have an apostle seal. 30-year amortization regardless of age, 10-year interest servicing only. Um, we also realize because a lot of our uh, clients tend to be high net worth, they may not actually show their true serviceability of a loan. So we have loan programs that do not require any income or personal income documents. And we'll go over that later. And I think one of the most important things is 97% of the loan applications that we submit actually get approved and closed. Um, again, we have 24 seven service, 30 loan officers, 12 different countries. We speak your language and your time zone. Uh, our specialty is uh, high value mortgages. So we've done them actually above 100 million. Um, all of the mortgages do not require AUM. Um, there's, uh, there are loan programs where serviceability is an issue. Um, PEP, I, I'm sure nobody is probably PEP here, but if, if that was the case, there's always um, banks that are willing to accept these for, for US borrowers. Um, we're actually very good at complex ownerships and structures. Um, and then if you need to close a transaction very quickly, we uh, have a lot of uh, bridge programs where you know, we can close a transaction in 10 days, um, sometimes quicker, and then put it into a, a proper mortgage down the road. Uh, so the loan programs that we have, um, we have uh, American Mortgage High Net Worth, uh, this is no personal income documents required. So we're not gonna ask for your Singapore tax returns um, where there's gonna be no AUM required, uh, no US credit. Uh, loan amounts for this program start at 3 million and they go up. The way that you qualify on this, it's, it's quite, quite simple and, and quite uh, convenient. If you have a liquid portfolio and a liquid portfolio could be anything from cash to stocks to bonds, we've even got it accepted with crypto. Um, we're going to need two months of those statements, and we're going to take an average balance of that as it, if it was depleted. Now, there is no encumbrance on this portfolio, meaning that once you qualify for that, you show the two months of bank state or the two months of uh, statements for this program, you the loan closes, 
the day after the loan closes, you can put that money, you can buy more Amazon stock, you can do whatever you want. There's no encumbrance onto this program. So it's a really easy way to qualify, especially if you have a uh, you know, reasonably high net worth. Um, and then on this program, because it's fairly simple, uh, we can close it in 30 days or less. It really just depends on uh, you know, how fast we can get the documents such as the title and appraisal and so forth. So our investor mortgage, which is probably our most popular mortgage, again, um, no income is required. When I, when I talked about this common sense underwriting, um, this is where this comes into play. Again, no AUM required, no US uh, credit required. We have loan amounts as low as 150,000 and it goes all the way up to 3 million, 75% loan to value. <clears throat> You're only going to qualify on the projected rental of the income uh, of the property. So when we do the appraisal, we're gonna order a supplement for the appraisal and that, that just like they would uh, gauge the uh, value of the property, they're also gonna gauge what the rental amount would be. Now, when you do that, that amount, so just, I'm just gonna throw out a number, say it's $2,000 that the property can be rented for, your mortgage is $2,000, including the insurance and the property tax. Uh, as long as it washes, then you qualify. So, um, you know, it was a lot easier when interest rates were, were quite low because normally you could get very high LTV on these programs, up to 75%. But with the interest rates a little bit higher, it doesn't mean that you can't qualify on this. It just means that the LTV may be reduced a little in the event that you know, the rent doesn't cover it. So our um, foreign, master, foreign national investor mortgage, again, all of our programs, except for the US citizens, do not require any personal tax returns. Um, no AUM is required. No US credit is required. Um, again, loan amounts from 150 to 3 million. The way you qualify on this loan is if you're employed, it's a letter from your employer. If you're self-employed, it's a letter from your accountant. And all that letter is, and we have a template that we actually give you, that letter just states two years of income and current year to date. With that, we use it as it was tax returns. And the reason why we do this is because we're doing loans from clients from Shanghai to Sydney to Singapore to wherever it may be, and it needs to be very uniformed. If we have to go through and, and you know, translate tax returns and, and currencies and so forth, it makes it very difficult. So if it's a very uniform, easy process, it actually makes the loan process quite smooth and easy. I think you'll probably find that our transactions, and this is a past clients of ours here, um, it's a very smooth, easy process. Uh, if you're a U.S. expat, I'm not sure if anybody here is holding a U.S. passport, um, but we try to make it as if you walked directly into a bank in New York. So same program, same qualifying standards, same rates. Um, so two years of tax returns are required. Again, no AUM. Um, you have to have a minimum credit score of 720. Uh, the loan amounts, again, from 150 to 5 million. You can qualify for up to 80% financing. Um, and you qualify for the same rates and terms as if you were living and working in the U.S., but without, you know, the issues of the W-2 and so forth. And again, to the 30 to 45 day closing. Um, if, and this is not uh, that uncommon, but if you're, again, a U.S. expat and maybe you haven't filed your tax returns or um, you don't show the income that you need in order to service the debt, then we also we kind of fall back on this program to where uh, you qualify again based only on the rental income of the property. It's actually a very simple, easy way to qualify. We've actually, I think, we've had several One Wall Street uh, clients qualify on this program. The services that we offer: <clears throat> residential mortgages uh, as low as one hundred fifty thousand dollars to no maximum. Uh, real estate portfolio mortgages, high net worth mortgage financing, buy to let mortgages, commercial financing, development financing, and uh, what's actually quite popular now is the asset backed. So just purely going off of the asset, property is worth X and will lend Y. Uh, the process is very simple. Initial phone call with a loan officer. You choose the loan program based on what you feel is, uh, you know, what you'll want to do and in interest rates and so forth. Um, you provide the relevant documents for the loan programs. The documents are actually quite simple and easy. 
Um, if your loan, if you're submitting everything, your loan approval is normally issued, which is actually a full bank approval within 72 hours. Um, you'll review the loan offer with your client. Um, if you have a property, you know, if, if you're buying one Wall Street and it's actually uh, close to being done, we've already started doing appraisals on one Wall Street. So it's actually a good time to do it. You'll order the appraisal. That's all done online. Um, you'll clear any underwriting conditions that they may have. And normally it's more third party stuff, title, et cetera. Um, oh, there's somebody at the door. Uh, we'll, we'll arrange the signing wherever you'd like to do it. If you want to do it in Singapore, if you want to fly to the US, you can do that. You actually don't have to, if, if you're going to do one Wall Street, you don't have to fly to New York. You could go to California, you could go on holiday in Florida, and we can actually send a notary to you. Um, the loan funds and records and closes in your name. We do all the work. We negotiate on your behalf with the bank. Um, we are very direct and transparent when it comes to fees. There's no application fee, no deposit. Um, and actually you never wind up sending any money to us. Everything is either done through an escrow or an attorney. So our capabilities in general, besides real estate mortgages, we do share financing, crypto financing, aviation financing, vessel financing, and then the asset back, which is also in Singapore as well. Um, we have over 150 lending relationships, and this is only strictly for the US. Uh, it's a very private, uh, confidential and, and independent process. Uh, we have a very personal responsive team. So you're actually assigned a specific loan officer that you'll work with. Um, we can work out a basic underline and some pricing without actually any paperwork. Uh, we have international coverage, flexible terms. We have very, uh, we have very, ex there, we're very experienced with high net worth and ultra high net worth. Um, and because we're probably the only company that's doing this uh, globally, right, outside of the US, it seems like a lot of loans, whether you go through a private bank or whatever, just seem to come back through us anyway. So. Uh, thank you. So um, we'll answer all the questions at the end, um, just so there's also live streaming, so we can kind of do all that as well. Um, but thank you for your time. And I'm going to introduce uh, Lydia, who is a US CPA living in Hong Kong with also an office in Singapore, only focusing on expats and foreign nationals. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this seminar. So I'm the just hope. So I'm Lydia Tang. I'm a US CPA. I'm the principal of America, uh, Africa's Tax Singapore. And we also have an office in Hong Kong. Okay. So uh, as you, you may all know, there's US taxes for buying US property, but there are many ways which we can help you save some taxes. So, so first to introduce ourselves. Yeah, you, we are a US tax firm. We mainly focus on preparing you U.S. tax returns for our clients. And we also prepare Singapore and Hong Kong and other taxes. So I have been a CPA in Singapore and Hong Kong for the past 10 years. So, and you know, previously I was a CPA working in California for the past like, yeah, 10 years. So I, I, I was working for 20 years as a U.S. CPA. So I had my uh, MS in U.S. taxation in uh, California, and my I have an MBA. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. So there may be some, uh, you know, like some people may be thinking, like about U.S. taxes, like uh, these you no know, horrible monsters and stuff. Actually, it's not. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay. You you know. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Okay. Stand up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I cannot move then, huh? Okay. So, what most people think about U.S. taxes? Stamp duty? No, there's no stamp duty in Singapore. There's stamp duty in Hong Kong. There's stamp duty, but not in U.S. How about cooling measures? No, there are no cooling measures. You know, in Hong Kong, you know, if you are foreigners, you might not be able to buy property at a low cost. 
you know, you have to pay, pay double stamp duty, like 15%. If you are a company, you're paying 30%. But in US, no, you don't need to pay any stamp duties and they won't, you know, they won't say, oh, you are not a US person, you cannot buy. They allow you to buy as many as you want. You can buy 100 if you have that amount of like money, but yeah, you know, really free. Even in Australia, you know, or in Canada, they are, you know, holding people in New Zealand, they are holding people to buy property, but not in US. So, so no matter you are US person, Hong Kong, Singapore, Indian, Russians, anybody, you can buy property as, as many as you may want. Okay, global taxation. Yes, there's global taxation, but sorry, only for US, US citizens. If you're not US citizens, you just buy, you know, buy your property and pay taxes only on your US property. But, you know, there are ways we can help you save your taxes. So we're going to talk about it. So we can take about, uh, you know, take advantage of all those tax deductions. Oh, sorry. Okay, so you have mortgage interest deductions, as Robert just talked about. Like, if you have mortgage interest, you can take out, you know, deductions from your mortgage. Property taxes, so you have to pay property taxes. So it's have everywhere in the world, you have to pay property taxes, but you can get deduction from your US property, you know, after filing your US tax returns. Insurance, you have to pay insurance for your property to protect yourself, right? So this insurance expenses, you can deduct. Depreciation, you know, this is one of the best things about America. You know, yeah, you know, if you're purchasing a property and the property is worth like a million, you can take a deduction, you know, it's like a wear and tear, you know, of, you know, your property, you know, you can take a deduction of 27.5 years over the course of your property. And this is really a good number, you know. Maintenance and repairs, you know, if you have repairs on your property, you can deduct that, you know, not in Hong Kong, not in Singapore. Legal and professional fees. So if you hire a lawyer, you know, for your property, you know, like legal documents and stuff, you can have deductions for your legal fees, professional fees. Say if you are hiring us for preparing your tax returns, you get deductions. Travel to inspect your property. So if you, you want to go to the US and, you know, inspect your property, you can do so. You can get a deduction for traveling to the US. So capital gains tax. Can it be mitigated, delayed, or optimized? Yes. The capital gain tax, you know, you can try to delay it. You know, there's a very generous, you know, rule for the U.S. There's a something called 1031 exchange. What 1031 exchange works is if you sell your property and if you have gains, you can delay the paying of your taxes. How you do it? You buy another property with a higher value, you know, not, not a very high value, maybe like $50,000 more. Still, you know, you can delay and then pay the tax later. However, you know, I, we have to be like honest with you. There are state taxes with like a, a foreigners buying a property. In the US, you know, you've, if, if you own a property, you know, you have a very good like estate tax allowance but not with the uh, non-resident, non you know, or not non-US persons. However, do you know, there are ways you can help, we can help you to avoid, you know, you can do to avoid your estate tax. One thing is you can hold your property in an LLC. So the company holds the property for you. Okay. And then the second thing is, you know, you can ask Robert for help, you know, because like you can borrow money and then the money, the interest, if it's a debt, you know, you can actually use this for deduction. So say, for example, you know, someone will die anytime, right? So if I die, I have a loan. So I need to pay estate taxes on my property. However, I have a big loan. So, you know, all my loan, I can deduct. So you're not paying a lot on your estate tax. So something about like, uh, we also need to know if you are a foreigner, you are buying a U.S. property. You know, there's something called third tax. How does it work? Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. So this is a tax act 
for foreigners. How it works is, you know, if you sell your U.S. property somehow in the future, you are supposed to, you know, the you know the agent is supposed to hold some money, some of your profit, so that you know you can pay your U.S. taxes. However, you know, you can get it back after you file your U.S. tax returns. You know. After deducting, you know, the cost basis, all the expenses of selling, like, you know, your, your agent fee, your property agent fee, you know, your, uh, your cost to improve your property when you, you want to make it ready for sale, all those costs, you know, you can deduct. And the net income that you got, you know, you, you know like after those deductions, you can get back the taxes the extra, extra, extra income. So usually, you know, you can get it back in six to six months to a year, but you can always get it back. Okay. So U.S. is one of the few countries that doesn't penalize foreign buyer for additional taxes simply because they are foreign buyers. As I just mentioned earlier, you know, like if you are, if you are Canadians, they, you know, if you're not Canadians, they might not allow you to buy a Canadian property. You can buy it, but may maybe you cannot buy it in a prime location. In Australia too, in Hong Kong, you need to pay 15% additional taxes, but not in US. So I'm going to give you an example, a case study. So say for example, a US property is a 1.5 million property. So, you know, first one, year one, I, you know, like your rent is $90,000. So as I just mentioned, there's a depreciation. The depreciation of the property is 54,545, right? And then you have HOA, homeowner associations, mortgage interest, property tax, homeowner insurance. All your total deduction is 160,000. As because you earn this rent and you're getting this deduction, you're actually having losses. So you do not need to pay taxes on these losses. And this lack losses, like we are assuming those numbers that don't, that don't change. Actually, you know, a few years later, you know, probably, probably the rent will increase. So, but like you, we're making it simple. So this loss will be 70,000 every year. Maybe until the fifth year, you know, you will have 30, you know, $350,000 losses. So this losses actually later, you know, when you sell your property, if there's a, that is a big gain, like a million, that loss will be able to reduce, you know, the actual profit that you have, which will be really good for you. Okay, so as you, we said here, accumulated losses will be added back to the cost of your property and the capital gains that you are paying will be lower. But I need to uh, let you know also, that when you sell your property, the depreciation the depreciation you take, you will have to act it back. But like also, this is already very favorable if you have such a big loss. Okay. So what are the tax implications and deductions if you choose to keep your property as your, your second home or you just want to use it as your primary residence and not rent it out? No tax. You don't need to pay any taxes. If you're a US person, you can deduct your property tax and your mortgage interest in your U.S. tax return. But if you're not a U.S. person, you just keep it and then let the property stay there. So it's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry. Oh, thank yeah. you.
Oh, it's working now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so why? I think one of the first things is development is developed by Macro Properties, one of uh, New York's largest developers, residential developers. They've been behind some of the major projects in New York skyline. They've built the tallest building overlooking Central Park. And this project, One Wall Street, is Harry Macklow's dream project. This was his vision to bring back an Art Deco historic building back to life. Perfectly located downtown Manhattan, New York City, situated right in the heart of the two of the world's most famous streets, Wall Street and Broadway. We've seen over $6.4 billion going into the transit um, infrastructure um, in downtown and 30 billion has been invested into the real estate market and infrastructure in the last decade. Since 2000, the downtown has come back to life. It's become a real residential area and the area has tripled with its residential population. One Rural Street is, tre is a treasured 1930s Art Deco landmark and it's been reborn. So why call this area your home? This is one of the most popular areas and more popular now so in the last 10 years. New York, uh, New York, New Yorkers themselves call the area Fiddy. It is home to New York Stock Exchange, Federal Reserve Bank, Wall Street. And despite the area being filled with CEOs and entrepreneurs, over 60,000 individuals call downtown home today. From internationally renowned sites and dwellings almost lavish to believe, you step outside the building and everything is on your doorstep. From retail to restaurants to parks to transit, it is all there and it's all within walking distance of one Wall Street. So what's happening within the prime market and uh, how quickly are we seeing the recovery? I was speaking to a group and I was speaking to Douglas Elliman uh, earlier this week and they, they always say a line to me whenever I catch up with them. New York housing market looks to have got the memo too and they certainly have. Recovery has bounced back dramatically in the last sort of two years. Since COVID, you, you look at what's going on in the residential market, we're seeing over 18% growth predicted in, in 22 and, and probably will hit above 20 to 21% before the end of the year. The world certainly has reopened and this market has very much bounced back. Right back at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a lot of um, a lot of the residents in the area sort of moving out and moving upstate and going to Connecticut, getting out of New York. Um, and there was a big concern. But what the banks, what the commercial buildings, all the companies have gone done in, in New York and especially in downtown, they've made people come back to work. They've brought downtown back to life. And, and we've seen the pickup come very quickly. You live by the water, you're right on the Hudson. You've got some of the best piers in, in, in within walking distance from One Wall Street. We have Pier 17, a place to be, lots of live music in the evening, fine dining down at uh, Pier 15 in the evenings. And there's a lot going on. There's a play, it's every, everyone's dream to be right on the water. And you step out of One Wall Street and it's right there. You're surrounded by stunning art and architecture. It's filled with sculptures. Um, everywhere you walk around downtown, you step at literally about two minutes outside of, um, uh, of the building and you step out the front door, there's the Bull of uh, Wall Street. There are the balloon artists all around the parks, all around the area, and the World Trade Center, the Oculus. There's so much to be seen, and that's the beauty of living in downtown and within uh, one Wall Street, that everything is there on your doorstep. It creates this amazing area to just step out and want to go to a cafe. You see a bit of sculpture, you see amazing architecture and probably the closest amount of historic architecture that you'll see within walking distance. Buildings are incredible. Not just one Wall Street, you've got the Empire State Building, you've got the Woolworth Building, you've got every bit of architecture there. St. Trinity's Church right next door to us, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral just down the road, Federal Reserve, I can go on, but there is architecture all within walking distance or close proximity to us near one Wall Street. Um, one, world, one World Trade Center, the site, behold, a testament to America's strength. It's right there. It's walking distance down the road. Fine dining in abundance. And one of my favorite tomacos is right there with some of the most famous people um, dining in it from Theodore Roosevelt to Mark Twain to Charles Dickens. Unfortunately, they're not with us today, but they've all uh, graced the, the doors of the markets. Capriano downtown, home of Harry's, Harry's Bar, classic Italian specialities. You've got amazing food truck and food parks within uh, walking distance in, in, in two of the main parks just uh, up the road from One Wall Street. Everything is on your doorstep with food wise and, and from fine dining to real local food, it is all there. Shopping, everyone's favorite pastime. 
you can spend a day and get lost in Brookfield Place. Um, and you've got Hermes literally around the corner. Every fine brand that you want is there and it's all within um, downtown New York. The area, as I mentioned to you just now, is, uh, is an area rich in history. Um, speaking of history, financial district streets are home to some of the oldest buildings on the island. Um, it's never witnessed uh, the beauty of Trinity's Church right next door to us. On the lower floors of the west side of the building, um, if you're off sort of floors five, six, seven, you have this beautiful clear line view of St. Trinity's and looking up. And it's, it's because of the way the buildings sit, you actually get a really good clear view of some of the best architecture um, within the area. So what's going on in the market? Um, and what I've done here is I've sort of taken the median um, sales over the last 10 years. But I think what's a, a really interesting, now if I get the buzzer, to, the light to work. No, nope, I'll point, it's all right. Um, what we look here at is you've got the median sales prices. And New York has been a bit of a roller coaster. It's been up and down through the financial crisis, through different um, parts. But if we take a look at the, the highest point, was, which was sort of 2019, pre-pandemic, and it really dropped down. The median house price dropped and dropped. We went down below the million mark. But what we're seeing now in, in the prime market is the bounce back in the recovery. Recovery and the number of sales, volume of sales. 2021, going into 2021, record numbers, over 4,000, nearly 4,500 sales um, in that year, in that period. And we're still doing well, well above the 3.5 mark and our median price shooting way above the one point, close to 1.2 million. So uh, median sales price rode at record high while average sales price reached its third highest that we've seen in a long time. And I think if you look here at the sort of the prices, we look at sort of where we were a year ago, Q1, uh, Q2 2021, we're at 1.9 million. We're now sitting at a median price of 2.1 million. Um, with up a 5.5% growth. The average price per square foot was sitting at about 15.48. We're now sitting at 16.70. Um, our new development prices have also gone up from 2.47 million up to 2.6. It's a 12.3% growth in 12 months. And this growth is continuing. These numbers speak for themselves. But what I really wanted to highlight is the number of sales close. We take quarter, quarter two last year, 3,417. We closed over 3,834 in the same quarter. That's 6.9% increase in sales in this year on year. Days on the market. We were, it, it's sort of, we were sitting at 169 days on the market when properties listed, now 86. And this is a really important thing to look at is how long a property is sitting on the market for and how quickly it's selling. Um, and, and listing discount from price. We were taking about a 6.4 average a year ago. We're now taking about 5.5. So we're seeing really strong growth and there's a lot happening in the market. Um, some key highlights, we're 10.6% up medium prices, closed prices at 12.2. Local inventory is down by 1.1%. And that's a key thing to talk about in New York at the moment. There is a mass demand for stock and they're not developing enough new homes. There's, not, there's no land, there's no new developments coming on. And there's a big crunch about to happen that there won't be enough supply in the next five years. Supply is dwindling every year. And that is going to push the market and that's going to keep these prices going up. When you have a demand and supply issue, when supply is low and demand is high, it, it keeps the market very volatile. It keeps it going very strongly and, and we see it. And you can see it in the, in the numbers as, as they grow as well. If we look at the market sold above uh, list price. So months of supply versus sort of the, the actual price, the last list price. We looked, the highest point was at 32%, which was about uh, 20 months of supply in 2015. The supply is really dropping down here. Um, sorry, it's peaking up, sorry. The prices, the list prices dropped down. So stuff that's going on the market, selling above list is the highest point selling above was in 2015. Now, beginning of 2021, it's all selling. Beginning to creep up a little bit, but it's still, you know, in five months supply, it's still there and it's still doing well. So we talk about supply and we look at sort of the price brackets. Where does um, one, one Wall Street sit? We sort of sit from our starting prices of a million and go all the way up to sort of into this bracket here. And if we look at the condo, condo which is the gray um, months, you can see the month of supply and how much stock is in the market at the moment. It is the condo, the sorry, co-op, which is a very historical type where you vote to be in the building, 
versus your condo, which is is your, your development such as One Wall Street and all the new builds. And if we look at the resales matrix, and I just wanted to highlight, even with the resales market, so this is secondary stock coming back in the market and coming to be sold. If we look at the numbers again, you know, Q1 last year, we were sitting at about 1.7 million, now sitting at about 1.76. Um, the number of deals closed, again, is on the rise from 3,000 up to 3,001. Um, and inventory is, is, has dropped. The number of listing inventory is down by, from 6.9 to 6.7. So it's showing you there's less stock coming into this market, even in retail, which is a benefit to anyone investing at the moment. The luxury markets, um, we've seen you know, a great uh, range of stuff here for, in the luxury. But I think what's really important to look at, again, from Q2 to, uh, last year to Q2 this year, we we're at 7.7 .7 million, the average price. We're now up to 8.8 .8 million in the luxury sector. So for those high, for the high rise penthouses, those sort of listings that sit from 5 million upwards, prices are really climbing and they're climbing really fast in, in the luxury sector. But also our price per square foot has gone up by about $200 a foot. Um, and listing a number of months of supply gone from 13.4 down to 11. Um, and that again is showing the supply is dwindling. So it's keeping the prices, while prices go up, supply is coming down. The largest first, second quarter of the rise of listing inventory in, in eight years is what we've seen in this quarter. New development. So this is where One Wall Street sits. Um, and our average prices a quarter ago, a year ago, sat at 3.8. We're now at 3.9. The number of sales more than doubled from the same period last year. Median prices rose one year for the second straight quarter. We've seen the strongest recovery in 15 years of a residential market in New York at the moment. Listing of inventory increased sharply year over year for the third consecutive quarter. New development, the average price mix, so the mix that's in the market. And, and again, this is quite an interesting one. If you look at the sales share, we're sitting at 1 million to 3 million, 47.2% uh, year on year change, 70% up. So the prices are, we're seeing recovery, we're seeing good growth. There isn't enough supply which keeps that market going. A lot of New Yorkers are buying in, but more importantly, we're seeing a lot of funds and, and fund equities coming into, into the market. The rental market. So as I mentioned to you, there was a mass exodus right at the beginning of uh, during the pandemic. People left New York. People left for upper states. They, 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 they walked out. Companies ensured that they did not allow work from home as much. Wanted people back into the offices, and this has increased. There isn't enough rental stock for people. People are queuing up, wanting to rent property at the moment, and they're having to wait up to three to four weeks to get into a property. Rental properties are coming on the market, and according to Douglas Elliman um, and Corcoran, both have said a, an apartment comes on the market, they don't even list it. It goes, and it's probably going for 10% above the, the listing price. So it is, it is very high demand, um, which is great if you're looking to buy for investment because a, a good quality new build in the heart of Wall Street, like One Wall Street, will, will demand a good rent and will rent quickly. So construction update, where are we with One Wall Street? Um, we are really excited. We're at TCA up to 20 floors 26. So that means that we have completed every floor up to the 26th floor. All the apartments are completed inside um, and are pretty much ready to, to live in. Um, all our residential facilities at the One Club, the bars, the restaurants, the gym, the swimming pool is now filled and ready to be used. It's all complete. The management team are on site and being trained. A phenomenal concierge team going in there. It's really exciting. That will be announced very, very soon. We've signed now 82 contracts have all exchanged. We need to get to 85 contracts to then execute our completion notices, which we believe if we get to where we are in the next two weeks, completions will start at the end of October, beginning of November and we will start from the ground floor upwards. Um, but it is very exciting. We're getting there. The development is coming to life. One other thing I wanted to talk about in the market and some very interesting news that's come out of New York residential market. Private equity funds are flocking in to scoop up uh, residential stock at the moment. Uh, Goldman Sachs reported recently they bought over 65 million of private residential apartments in downtown Manhattan. Two developments, they bought uh, two, uh, four of the floors, I believe, um, from two different developers. Uh, JP Morgan have just done a deal of 240 million, uh, prime residential developer in Upper Manhattan, reported uh, by the Wall Street Journal in July 22. 
Numora Bank, private bank, reported to buy four floors of prime New York residential in a residential tower, all at market rates. And when I spoke to the agents, I sort of said, well, you know, are they getting good discounts and that? They're all buying at, at pretty much market value. It's probably about a five to six percent discount, if that, but they are buying purely for long term investment and for those funds. Maclow, currently we are in negotiations on two floors um, in the building. Um, to a global fund, um, and that is, and again, that is probably it, it, it being agreed at a minimal discount level, um, and that is being retained for a ten to fifteen year hold. Um, so it's a family private office that are looking to to buy that. We also, and I'll now jump into the project itself and introduce One Wall Street to you. So I wanted to just read something out to you, which um, was was read by um, the New York um, Wall Street Journal uh, reporter at the grand launch of One Wall Street, which I think sums up the, the, the project itself. One Wall Street is one of the finest pre-war condo conversion developments in all of New York City. During the Roaring Twenties, the Irving Trust Company, then the nation's fifth largest bank, assembled at the site of the financial district's premier site, and in 1931, the bank erected a further its 50-story tower, 654 foot the tallest headquarters then stood the 10th tallest building in the world world-renowned architects ralph thomas walker dubbed the architect of the century because he created one wall street as an art deco icon and then announced multi-awards winning from the american institute of architects wrought in a tower of understated yet opulent art deco style the walls clad with undulating limestone, carnivorous red room on the ground level, banking hall, seen like no other, it clad in red and orange, golden mosaic tiles, and a matching white room clad in a more mother of pearl, seashells, and beacon-like pinnacle. This is One Wall Street. And when Maclow took over the building, their idea was to transform such a beautiful icon into a modern new residence. And that's what we've done over the time. We've created, we're creating over 50 stories of 556 apartments. Um, team behind it, we've got Maclo Properties, famous for their elite portfolio in Manhattan real estate, including the um, iconic glass cube, Apple Store, which you've probably all seen, and also Fifth Avenue and 49, uh, 432 Park Avenue. Sits right in the heart of New York. Some of these buildings are the most iconic of New York skyline, and One Wall Street is about to become the next one. We have Slice Architects who are been, in, been one of New York's most famous architects firms uh, around and globally renowned in the business for over 75 years. They brought in Amidas Architects to help with the restoration of the Art Deco building. They're, they are the most famous architects you can get that understand how to bring to life the Art Deco limestone and restore a building of this nature. Interior Architects uh, designed by Deborah Burke and Partners and Ash and Leonardo. Again, Ashley Leonardo very much um, focus on the Art Deco features and Deborah and Burke on the, the main interiors. Art Deco masterpiece, one great building at the time. As I mentioned, it was built and designed as a, a token, as a, a symbol of the Irving Trust Company when, it, when they bought the site. They wanted something that would stand strong and prominent at the beginning of Wall Street. So as you came into Wall Street, you would always notice it. And that's what uh, one Wall Street is today. The building itself, it's not, it's not many places in the world where you can buy into a piece of history, but also live in a brand new new build internally. So the building is an Art Deco building, but internally it is a complete new, brand new condo uh, development. We have so much retail in this building um, and we're really excited. Um, only about three or four days ago, um, we have signed an agreement with a Peton, uh, the French uh, designer store, um, which is a bit like Harrods um, or Selfridges. It's never been outside of Paris and they have secured 54,000 square foot in the building, the actual Red Room. They're gonna bring a new department store to, um, to New York um, and it's gonna be a very exciting concept. So it does mean that we have now secured all of our retail space in the building. We have Whole Foods, we have the gym, and we also have our uh, designer interior store as well. All our uh, facade, all our interiors, uh, we have tried to keep them as they were. So we've kept the mosaic tiles, the Greek finishes, all of the Art Deco features remain. And you, as you walk through the building, you see it. 
And the more, every time you go into the building, it gets more exciting because they've actually brought back to life stuff that hasn't been seen for many years or was hidden away when it was a commercial building. We have many facilities and our internal, internal apartments, the residents, we have four or five different types of residences, high ceilings, modern European appliances, underfloor heating, um, we, where, where we can, we've made the best views of, of Statue of Liberty. Um, you've got terraces, so we've used as much outside space as we can to really bring to life the apartments. The One Club. This is over 170, let me get it right, 176,000 square foot of facilities within the building. We have a 75 meter pool, glass wraparound that looks straight out down to Statue of Liberty one side um, and, and, and downtown. It is unbelievable, right up on the high floors. You have the one, uh, one club restaurant, you've got a bar, you've got a gym, you've got a teenage lounge in there, you've got, um, we've got storage, we've got bike storage, you've got pet grooming in the basement, um, you've got the gym, you've got pretty much every facility you can think of. It's 176,000 square foot of uh, facilities for the residents. Um, the bar and the club will provide in-room dining to your apartments if you require it. There's entertainment, there's concierge, there's doorman. Everything's been put on, a full five-star offering. Big lavish outdoor spaces uh, for you to have fire pits, barbecues, all of that can be booked through the terrace, uh, through the management. Whole Foods within the building. So we have the Whole Foods supermarket, which sits on Broad Street and goes straight out. Can, and residents have their own private entrance through the building. Um, so you've got your supermarket. Lifetime gym, all complimentary membership to all residents within the building. So you've got your Pilates, your yoga, you've got the full Zen spa, you've got the full experience in, in here. It is a real modern gym available to all residents with complimentary membership. And as I mentioned to you, the Red Room. The Red Room was originally designed as the original banking hall um, and the Irving Trust building, when they designed the building, they didn't want a boring um, banking hall where it sort of felt cold and miserable with loads of desks. They wanted to feel a bit of room design that felt like your living room. And so the red room was designed. And this will now be mis uh, restored by, by Preton and will be created into this amazing new retail offering of over 54,000 square foot of luxury goods, menswear, women's wear, jewelry, makeup. Um, basically another version of sort of a Harrods within your own building, which will be a phenomenal thing for, for New York and, and for One Wall Street. So we sit on two of the most famous streets, as I mentioned, we sit on Wall Street and Broadway, and to the rear, we sit on Exchange and New Street. The neighborhood, I've sort of touched on it before, but there is pretty much everything on your doorstep here. Um, Location-wise, you've got at least two Michelin-style restaurants, 6.4 billion invested in downtown transit, four major food halls, seven farmers markets, access to over 30 miles of east side and west side cycling paths, um, 13 subway lines, 20 ferry routes, whichever way you want to travel. And more importantly, the heliport to get you out to the Hamptons for the weekend in the summer. Very important indeed. <laughs> 20 playgrounds and 172 acres of, of Governor's Island, over five minutes away by ferry. So everything is there on your doorstep. And just to give you a bit of an idea, here we are. We sit here in what we call the financial district. You've got Pier A here. In the evening, if you want to go to one of the best restaurants in the evening for dinner, watch the sunset go down. Highly recommend there. Um, drinks and everything down here, Pier 17, Pier 15, um, and then your heliport straight out to the Hamptons. Um, you've got all the retail, as you can see there, cafes, restaurants. Um, you've got the airport. Uh, you've got Hermes, Seaport, Tiffany. Um, I can go on. Number one, number one being Brookfield Place, literally about a 10, 10 to 15 minute walk away from, from the development. And you get lost in there for a full day's shopping. Um, landmarks downtown, uh, we've talked about it, probably the most iconic being Trinity Church sitting right next door to us. You've got Federal Hall, which is walking distance away from us, um, and the Federal Reserve, of course, um, and many more, you know, uh, down to the Battery, which is a massive big park, great green open space. Um, I could go on and I won't bore you too much. The great outdoors, as I mentioned to you, I don't know many developments where there's over nine or ten parks on your doorstep. Um, they are right there, walking distance to it. As I mentioned, the Battery, one of my favourite little spots to go. But you've also got Rockefeller Park, you've got South Cove, and you've got this whole cycle path that goes all the way around. Um, 
it's all there. East, the East River Waterfront Esplanade as well, uh, phenomenal. Um, and then 13 subway lines, 30 bus routes, six ferry lines, uh, six ferry lines, 20 ferry routes, and 28 city bike stations. There's a city bike station right outside. I'm just going to play a little video now. that. So Julian, uh, now we have come to the Q&A section. I would like to invite all our speakers uh, up front so that we can start. Um, we can open the floor to questions as well as I'm taking some questions from the um, audience online as well. But just for your information, these are our contact details. And if you want to, you can scan our QR code to like Seville Singapore's LinkedIn as well as Facebook page. So I'll just take one question from the audience online first. Okay. Um, this one would be posed to Robert. Robert, how would the rising interest rates impact residential property values in the coming years? Uh, actually, I think with rising interest rates, as long as the yields are, or the rental rates are rising faster, which they are, and I think Julian can you know, uh, state this as well, I don't think we're going to see a slowdown in the property purchases, which will actually increase the values of the properties. 100%. Yeah, yeah I think you're very yeah, spot on. I would say with, with seeing the, the rate of rentals and the, the yields increasing, it should be. Yeah. yeah, we've actually seen an increase in applications. And I think mainly, uh, sorry, am I, I'm standing this way. Sorry, Julian. I think you need am I? Oh. Okay. Anyway, um, we're, we're seeing uh, actually an increase in rental applications because the yields are actually much higher now than they were when rates were 3%. So. Thank you very much. Maybe we can open the, the questions to the floor. Anyone in the audience have anything to ask? Well, yes, ma'am. Okay, sure. Thank you. From her presentation, it sounded like buying a property in New York as a foreigner has got far more advantages than a local. They're the, same. They're the same, but you say we don't have to pay taxes, whereas the local oh, would have to pay. Have to pay. Yeah, they have to pay. pay taxes, but you have to pay. You have to pay. You have protections. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. U.S. persons like like I'm a U.S. citizen. If I have properties in Hong Kong, China, everywhere, I have to pay global tax but like for you or for anybody who is a new US, not a u.s person you only pay taxes on your u.s property only yeah so yeah i'm a foreigner mm -hmm. and i have a daughter with a pr there mm -hmm. is it better to buy her name or my name or it doesn't make a difference you know as i just mentioned right there are ways that you can delay your paying your, your taxes right yeah, so right. either way is fine way is the same. yeah well, I think the good thing about the U.S. is it doesn't matter if you're a U.S. citizen or a foreign national, you take advantage of the same tax structure 
and the same uh, discounts as you would regardless of the tax board. And that's a very unique feature of the US, of uh, the tax code. I think people have a very different misconception of what US taxes are. It's certainly not as, as Daunting. Daunting as, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not as daunting as it would be in many countries. And I think if you look at the state tax, too, yeah. if you talk about the UK, what they just announced is they're, they're uh, taxing people globally on what they yeah. own on the debt. In the US, it, it, it's it's a much better uh, option if you're looking at investment properties. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think uh, in relation to that as well, since you, uh, the lady asked, is it, okay, just let me bring up that. So is it possible to buy the property in um, the child's name, but take a loan from uh, the parents? So yeah. the parents can take the loan as long as the child is 18, they can be added to the title of the property. Mm -hmm. So um, they can still, you know, have the ownership, they can mm -hmm. have the benefits, uh, but the loan itself can yep. be taken out in, you know, mm -hmm. whoever uh, name it can be, but adding to someone the title as long as they're 18 is fine. Okay, and then uh, the follow-up question on that is that, will they incur any costs before the loan approval? No, I mean, not before the loan approval. Before the loan closes, the only cost that you'll actually have out of pocket is the appraisal. So the appraisal needs to be ordered in order for the underwriting to be done completely. So that's the only cost that you'll have up until the end of the loan. Okay, great. Um, one more question. What is the, so the property for One Wall Street is still under construction, right, Julian, and yes. not actually built, finished. Maybe you can touch on when the completion of that is going to be and some of the uh, return of investments on that. Yeah, so the, the building itself, we are, as I mentioned, we are up to level 26. So everything from 26 down is now complete and built. Um, we are aiming to have completion by of the whole building of everything, including the lobbies and the retail by the end of this year. So about 31st of December, the full building will be completed. Com mm -hmm. um, moving in and, and us serving notice, so getting you to start your completion process with us, we are aiming for that to be starting from the end of October, beginning of November. As I mentioned to you, we, we, we're TCA of... Um, Sorry, we are, we've 85, con, uh, we're 83, sorry, 82 contracts signed. We've got to be at 85 contracts to start applying for our completion certificates. So we're probably a week or two weeks away from mm -hmm. doing that process. Mm -hmm. And then it's another month or so for us to then start completion. Okay, so following that question as well, um, with so many people working from home post-COVID and office workers driving so much vital retail business in a city, what are the prospects of the 40% office vacancy rate recovering in the short term? We're seeing already, um, you know, I think a lot of the big companies, especially in New York and, and in Manhattan, have all declared um, that the workers are, are working from, from office. They, they have their flexible working, but majority of the time is back in the office. And that's why this rental recovery has come so quickly in, yeah. in New York. And we've seen it come back really quickly because people moved out very quickly, working from home. They were in Connecticut. They were all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they had to get back into downtown to be back mm -hmm. at work in the financial district. And people have had to move in and, and rent again. Um, and that's continuing this rental uh, rush to get people back into the city. I see. Okay. Can I take another question from the floor? Yes, Mr. Uh, in terms of uh, purchasing a New York property, would it be more advisable to take it in the name of LLC or individual? Uh, so you can do either. Um, we allow LLC uh, holdings. We also allow individual holdings. I think uh, Lydia can prob yeah Lydia can probably advise on why an LLC would maybe be more beneficial. But I think that's something you would have to run by your attorney on what the benefit is. But for us, the mortgage is the same, whether it's uh, an whether it's head, held in an entity or it's held in an individual. The borrower themselves have to be the individual, but how you hold the property is entirely up to you. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Okay, so if you are, okay. Yeah, we just speak. Okay. Hello, Joe. So as I just mentioned, you know, like in the state tax, if uh, on US persons, right? So you want to, you know, try to minimize your estate tax 
in case it happens. So because estate tax happen anywhere, just he mentioned about inheritance tax in UK. So we would want to minimize it. So how we do it, you can set up an LLC to hold your property if you are a foreigner. But if you are a US person, you might not need it. So it really depends on, you know, how you want it to be worked out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any in, uh, in advantages in terms of income tax? Actually, if uh, LLC, the tax will be a little bit higher. But as we have done that, like example, the case study, mm -hmm. you know, actually you're not paying any taxes, right? I have a client who held like six properties in New York. They're not paying taxes. No, state taxes, as state taxes, you know, we will pass one day, right? Oh, no. Income tax. State. Yeah, yeah. State, uh, you know, you, there's a New York state tax and there's a federal tax. So there are two tax returns you will need to. Yes, but however, as we mentioned about the case study, the federal tax, you know, normally with all this income and deductions, you're not paying any. You just need to file your returns. If with the New York one also, because with all those deductions, you are not actually paying taxes. But you need to, because this is the state and the federal requirement. And how is property tax levied? So the property percent? tax is according to like the city or the county, you know, it's a certain percentage of the prop, the properties assessed the value each year, you know. And what percentage is that? Do we know? It could be 1.68 to 1.73. It's not as bad as the medium rate, you know, of the whole uh, U.S. Assess well. I think the good, again, the, the positive thing about the U.S. is you have the same tax deductions as a, as a foreign national as you would as a U.S. citizen. Yes. So you can write a lot of this off, or a, you know, as, as Lydia was saying, you can actually show almost a loss that will carry forward throughout the years. So There is no limit for the loss because you, you, you have the loss, right? If you sell it later, you know, it will add up to your cost, you know, like, so then your gain will be low. You know, but I just mentioned about the depreciation you have taken, it will be recaptured back as well. So that's, but in the end, that's actually a really favorable situation for you, for you as, you know, a renter. Yeah. Sorry, sorry the, the carry forward of the loss applies to both the individual and the LLC or just the LLC? Both. Both? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead. It's interesting that it Carries forward even for the for the individual. Yeah, of course, right? Uh, US is fair, you know. Yeah. I, have, I have a question uh, for I guess we got that. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Robert. So uh, I guess we all know that New York's the center of a lot of good education, good high schools, good colleges. And I guess a lot of parents would want their kids to go to these schools and upon graduation, 18 or whatever. Are there any benefits sort of building credit, for example, if the property, if there's a mortgage in their name? That, that's... <laughs> that's actually a very good question. Um, if you want to add a child to a mortgage, as long as they're 18, um, it allows them, say they're going to school, NYU, I always have a, a gentleman here, his son's going to NYU. If you want to add them to the mortgage, they can start developing credit history. So if they choose to stay in New York after and, and they want to work, you know, as everybody knows, you can't do anything in America without credit. And if you have bad credit, it's, you know, you're, you're in big trouble. Okay, I think we have uh, one question for Julian. Um, what sort of buyer profiles are there in, currently in New York and maybe uh, for One Wall Street as well? Um, so yeah, one Wall Street at the moment, we're, we've got a bit of a mix in the building. Uh, we have got um, a, a lot of probably about 30% is um, investment, mm -hmm. but the remainder remainder is is owner occupiers. And that is a lot of New Yorkers buying. Mm -hmm. We've got some larger properties up in the, the higher part of the building, sort of three, four, five beds. Um, and we're getting a lot of New York families looking at it because it is a, an art deco building. Mm -hmm. Fiddy is a really new, cool area. 
Um, and a lot of the older families want to be in this area, location because it's just easier to get to the office. We've got a good mix of uh, parents working in this in the um, financial district um, during the week and then flying out um, to Connecticut for the weekend with the families. So they're using this sort of pied de terre as well. So it is a real good mix. It's not all rental investors in the building. Um, we have tried to keep it, but we've, we've found in a way that owner occupiers seem to be more popular and it, it's, mm -hmm. it's the design of the building. We've got some large apartments in there, so it, it attracts the local market. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, one question as well for you. Do you think New York real estate is slowing down? I think probably from your market update <laughs> early on, uh, maybe I, I he think, missed yeah. that portion of it, but it, the answer it's is no. Right? Definitely no. Yeah. I think, you've, as I mentioned, there's a massive supply issue and that's not going to be addressed for the next yeah. 10 years. So it's only going to see the prices yeah. keep going. I think if I was here in a year's time mm -hmm. doing the same sort of presentation, we'd just see the upward curve going upwards even more. I think probably because the sentiment out there is that everybody's saying a recession is coming. So the sentiment yeah. is that people are going to be more cautious. Maybe the market will be slowing down. But in the cases you have showed earlier with all the research reports, yeah. it is not that. It is not that. It's not. And I think also the fact that the big funds, the big banks are yeah. all investing, you know, they're not going in and buying at heavy discount. They're buying at three, four percent market rate. Market rate. Yeah. And, and that's a big indicator. They've got a long term view. Goldman Sachs, John, uh, JP Morgan mm -hmm. are all in there. They're all buying. And they're taking that long-term view, so it gives you know it gives good good feeling that the market, they, the people at the top in the banks know what mm -hmm. they're doing. Well, they sometimes do, but you know <laughs> <laughs> the market's on on the up. So yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we've covered most of the questions online. Um, anything else from the floor from anyone? Ah, okay. Let me just double check. Okay, um, for Julian as well. Last week, Bloomberg reported that the rental rates increase over 11% year on year, despite rising rates and economic uncertainty. So do you think that uh, this will continue to increase? Yeah, I do. I think it's, it's also what, what Robert was talking about earlier, with, even though the, we're seeing yields jump uh, mm -hmm. because there's more, there's not enough rental property on the market. Mm -hmm. So demand is there. And, and uh, I was talking, as I mentioned, I talked to Douglas Elliman the other day. They had one rental building with, I think, four apartments in. They took the listing. It was on the price was they didn't even put it on the listing. Mm -hmm. They had 15 people queuing in the lobby waiting for one apartment. Um, and that went at 30 percent above the list price. That's just one example. And yeah. that's happening the whole time in New York. So, yeah, it's predicted it's going to continue. It's a supply issue as well. Thank you very much. So um, we are at the end of our Q&A. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time to attend. Um, every one of our speakers here will be hovering around later, so if you have any more questions, you can actually approach us one-on-one -on -one to ask. So thank you very much, and thank you to the audience online as well, and we hope to see you next time if we have another seminar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much.